Good morning, my name is Lina Giraldo. I'm Partner Support Executive from Exim. Welcome to the session Ethical Hacking. We will record the session and you can find the presentation in your social media tools. I will leave 10 minutes at the end for questions. Please write it in English. Welcome, Patrick. It's your turn. Hello? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Was, uh, should I introduce myself or? Yes, please. Okay. Hi. I will turn on my video uh, for the introduction. Oh, that's not working. Uh, I'll do it without video. Hi. My name is uh, Patrick de Brouwer. I'm working at uh, Security Academy in the Netherlands and I do uh, hacking courses. I make the course material and practical exams as well as uh, teaching the courses. And today I will present you with uh, a sneak preview from one of our courses, Ethical Hacking Foundation, which we will cover uh, its SQL injections on an open source web application. Okay. Okay. Should I should I start or uh, are you yes, going to start now? Yeah. All right. Um, can anyone can everyone see the slides? Yes, we can see that. Okay. All right. We will start with the demonstration for SQL injection, um, and we have a scenario set up for this demonstration where a client has requested us to do a black box penetration test on their web application. Um, we have been given a waiver. This means that we have permission to attack the web application and that we are allowed to perform hacks on it. Uh, always make sure you have one. We have login details for the application, but we do not have admin rights. And one of the options we can try later on is to get admin rights. And in order to make this realistic as possible, um, we can use any tools that we want, uh, which includes um, private stuff um, or tools that are available on the black market or dark web or deep web, however you call it. Because as a penetration tester, you have to make sure uh, that you can test an application as realistic as possible. So you have to know what tools the bad guys use. Um, one of the things that clients request is that you specifically do not run a denial of service attacks, but uh, you have to consider that it is possible that it happens. So it's not the intention, but it might happen that an application will go down. So make sure that your client has taken the appropriate steps uh, so it cannot happen. What will we cover during this demonstration? We have uh, a brute force login attempt. So there is a login field on the web application, which we will try to break into. Um, we will verify if it's possible to do a brute force attack, which means that we have a list of usernames and passwords and we want to try them. Um, we do information disclosure vulnerabilities. That means that an application will reveal way too much information, uh, which we as an attacker can use um, to create an attack. Then we will focus on SQL injection where we will show some tricks, uh, for example, reading local system files and grabbing usernames and passwords from the database is one of the main um, targets from this demo. If a web application gets hacked, if a company gets hacked, one of the um, actions that happen a lot is that data gets stolen. For example, customer data or usernames and passwords. And we will cover um, how to extract usernames and passwords from a database during this demonstration. Um, seeing that this is a two-hour demonstration, it's shorter than the extended one. The extended demonstration of this subject contains um, PHP shells through SQL injection, which means that you can execute code on the server and eventually take over the server and get the same access as the system administrator. If there are any questions, please let me know. First, we will take a look at the web application and I will try to share my screen with you. 
Um, I will see if this works. And my question is if everyone can see the screen. Uh-oh. Uh, my WebEx is gone. All right, it seems to work. My WebEx screen is gone, so I don't have uh, the slides here, but let me see if I can uh, get the slides back. No. Is it possible for the students to uh, view the slides themselves? Uh, no, but they just can see what we share with them, so. Okay. Then I will um, do it another way. I will do it this way. <laughs> so we still have the slides. Yes. Okay. What I'm running here is a version of Kali Linux, uh, which is a version of Linux that includes a lot of security tools, uh, vulnerability tools, scanning tools, um, basically everything you need uh, as a penetration tester. Um, I connected this uh, image to the virtual machine that runs this web application. The application is called Orange HRM. Um, and this application contains several vulnerabilities um, which we will try to discover. <clears throat> what do we see? A usual um, person just sees a welcome screen with a login name and password and, for example, some text. But for the rest, uh, a general um, a visitor doesn't see anything weird. If you go into the mindset of a hacker, um, what you see is a login screen. Maybe we can attack this login screen and try to get access to the application. Another thing is that we see a software name and a version number. Uh, this information is very useful for a penetration tester or hacker um, if he wants to break in because with this information, we can go on Google. Um, let's see, we can try it right now. If we go to google.com, then we can uh, put in Orange HRM version uh, 242. Vulnerabilities. And there we go to a website, and there were several results where we can see vulnerabilities for version 242, multiple vulnerabilities. Um, cross-site scripting and SQL injection. So with the information of a username, uh, I mean a uh, software name and version number, an attacker can try to find vulnerabilities that are already public online. So if a company is running this software right now, an attacker can look up the software name and version number and just Google, are there any leaks in this software? Um, and here it just shows you how to use them. The first thing we want to try during this demonstration um, is a login form. So we want to see if it's possible to do a brute force attack on this form. Why do we want to do this is um, we already received login details from a client. We haven't seen this yet in the demonstration, but um, during the scenario, we have been given uh, credentials. Um, but we want to make sure that the application does not even allow uh, the brute force attacks. We need to test how the web application handles login attempts. And how we do this is we just try to log in with a non-existent user, for example, test and the password test. Click. It just shows infinite login. Um, this is a very generic message. Uh, so that means it doesn't give us much more information other than it's not working, period. So if an application says username unknown or password incorrect, from those two where the username is unknown, you can do something what is called username enumeration. That means that you can try a list of usernames and try to find a username that is actually existing. If it says invalid password, you know that the application, I mean the username you have tried is correct is existent. So every little bit of information can be useful during um, hacking and penetration testing. So we try a few login attempts eventually. Um, we try test two with some passwords. Click, 
we try another one, click, we try it again, and we don't get locked out. The website does not show us a message that you are not allowed to log in anymore because you're banned or blocked or whatever. So what we try is um, basically this, this shows us that it is possible to do multiple login attempts. To do this, we can. there are several pieces of software available. One of the software pieces that we can use is called Burp Suite. Burp Suite is a, a package that comes with Kali Linux, a free version of it. And basically, it's uh, acting as a proxy server between you and the web application. Everything you do on the web application gets logged in this proxy server, and you can try to edit requests while you are working in it. So basically, it allows you to um, do things while you're just browsing. In the professional version, uh, right now you're going to see the free version, but in the professional version, it is also possible to do automatic scans. So while you are browsing, the Burp Suite application goes in the background and does, does additional requests to the server. Um, I see a few messages from people that do not listen. What does that mean? So they do not have audio? Uh, yes, but it could be something in the system. I already sent to them the instructions, so you can continue, don't worry. Okay, thank you. Right here we see um, the application, Burp Suite Free Edition, and um, to use this piece of software, we need to install, uh, we need to use the proxy server that it uh, starts in our browser. If you show options and you see um, connections, uh, let me see where it is exactly. It should be here somewhere. Well, anyway, what it usually does is that the Burp Suite, here it goes, shows a proxy service started on a local host and port 8080. So that means that we can use this proxy server in our browser and we're gonna see what happens when we do this. Installing a, a setting up a proxy server is basically just default in the web browser. So we go to advanced in Firefox, we click settings, and we configure the server as our proxy server. And what we do now is we try to log in again with just the test account again. Test, test, and I click login. What happens now is that my Burp Suite application is intercepting my request and tries to ask me, and ask me if I want to edit it. So I have to open the application and go to my proxy tab and then it shows me the request. What we as a regular visitor see in our browser is just um, a URL where it posts our um, data but your browser sends a lot of more information towards the website uh, in the background. We don't see this usually, but it is what's being sent. So actually for the demo, let me um, restart the request to the application. I'll close my browser first and I will reconnect, click. And then Burp Sheet should ask me again if I wanna connect. Sorry for the confusion. Let me try to test login again. So Burp Suite intercepts our proxy and what we can do is we can edit the request before it gets sent to the web server. So that means if we want to do some injections, uh, for example, cross-site scripting, we could do um, things like script. I don't know if anyone has tried cross-site scripting but you can just insert data here and then send it to the web server. So that's a useful tool for penetration testers to uh, use during tests. What I'm gonna do now is that I'm gonna uh, click this button where it says intercept is on to make sure that my intercept is off. Uh, that means I can just browse the website normally without the verb suite um, intercepting it. I'll try it again and it works. Okay. Sorry. So we see the free version, we see the requests. Uh, we disable the interception because we don't need it really. 
Um, and what we want to do now is that we want to prepare a brute force attack. We first need to do a login attempt with Burp Suite, then we navigate to the history tab to see what happens. Uh, one useful thing here is that, sorry, wrong button, uh, is that Burp Suite comes with um, the proxy server and it shows what you have done before. So we can actually go back to the request we have done previously. What we can do here is that we view this request and we can see what we have and we can use it to go <coughs> um, to the uh, repeater, for example. It's a function within Burp Suite and what the repeater does, it allows you to repeat the question towards the server. So if we click go without editing any information, it just goes back to the page and we can spam our mouse button. We can actually keep clicking it so we can see if we get different results. Um, we can also try to edit our cookies, for example, or we can try to edit the password. So if I wanted to change my username from test to non-existent account, for example, then I can filter in text for this text. So we can see that it actually sends the data I've edited here towards the site and shows us the feedback the website gives us. Okay. We can try to log in with the credentials we have given, which are user2 and user2 as password. So the username is user2 and as well as the password is user2. We're going to try that and go back to our proxy tab to see what happens after we log in. User2, user2. And it says welcome. Well, this is a working set of credentials that we have been given by our clients. We're going to see in Burpsy what happened to um, our request. What we want to do is we have post requests and get requests. And the difference between these two, get requests are requests that you uh, do when you, for example, click a link or uh, click something on the website. When you do a post request, it means your browser actually sends data, within, which in this case is our login credentials. So we see that it has logged in. We see um, the response from this web application is that it does um, a location change. So it actually redirects us to a different page. Um, an important thing to see here is that we, if we look at the status tab, we see here 200, 200, 200, and there we see a 302, which means um, the web server sends us a redirect. And previously we have done invalid logins and we get a 200. And when uh, we do a successful login, it says 302. That means we can see the difference between a working login and a not working login. So we can easily determine if uh, we use a list of usernames and passwords, if it worked or not. It also sets a cookie, logged in is true. So that's, um, that's something you can see that if it sets the cookie that we have logged in, then it means we have logged in. If we take a few steps back and look at the cookies that it has been set, we go back to the application, I mean to the verb suite, and we go to our very first request. Um, no, we go to the second request, excuse me. I restarted my browser um, a minute ago and revisited the application. And there you can see the web browser. Here is my request. And there is a response from the web server. And it actually sets a cookie, a cookie named PHP sys ID, which is a session cookie that is used in PHP. Um, if we log in, then eventually it will set another cookie named logged in. Logged in is true. The problem here is, is that we don't have any flags attached, such as HTTP only and secure. If you do penetration testing, uh, these are one of the things you need to pay attention to. Uh, what is the problem with these two is, um, I can do it, as it says, we don't cover it in this demo, but I can give a short explanation. HTTP only makes sure that only the web application can access this cookie. Uh, secure, make sure that the cookie is only being transferred in a HTTPS, so a uh, secure connection. All 
All right, let's continue the attack. If uh, we know that a valid login, we get a different response from the web server. And we, if we want to do a brute force attack, we need to have a list of usernames and passwords. Um, they're also included in Kali Linux, but we can use a small word list uh, for demonstration purposes. Now, I need to verify if I have that list available here on this machine. Um, test. I'm not sure right now, but that's no problem. We can try to create our own little list. What we can do is we go to the request where we log in. Um, excuse me, let me get rid of this screen. Go. We go back to the request, and what we're going to do is right-click, and we send it to the intruder. The intruder function within Burp Suite is a tool that allows you to uh, insert payloads. And with payloads, we mean a list of uh, uh, attempts. If we look at positions, we see a target, which is our target machine. And if we look at positions, we can see at what parts of our requests this application can inject data. The only thing that we want to try is to find a working username and password. So we can clear um, all these things. And we can only select the, where it uses the username. We click Add. And then where it uses a password, we click Add as well. So that means only in the field of username and the field of password, it will inject our data, and we can try there to try a list of usernames and passwords. All right, we can try this option first. Uh, usually what you want to do is you want to select a list of usernames and a list of passwords. Um, but if we want to want to try something, we can try to insert some usernames here. For example, administrator, Oops, add uh, root, a test, user, admin. Um, yeah, for example, HR admin, you never know, Orange HRM, which is a software we've been using. Demo is a useful one. Um, you always want to include accounts like these when you're doing brute forces because in practice, uh, it always can occur that people forgot to delete test login accounts. All right. So that's what we have done. Uh, what we're going to do is, uh, in this case, we selected in the screenshot a cluster bomb attack, which will make sure that um, the data will be sent uh, separately. So you have an option where you can send uh, the same data in the username and field um, as well as in the password field but you also have the option to insert a different data in both fields. Um, I have a question from Eddie. Why did you select the 302 event? In theory, we have not had any login yet. We, we try figuring out uh, how to access our brute force. What he's asking is, uh, how can we see a successful login if we haven't had login details? Eddie, uh, we have actually received in a login details from our clients, which we use to test what response we get from the web server. So we do have login details. But what we are trying to do right now is we want to make sure that the application um, is not allowing a brute force attack. So we want to try if we can do that. And another thing we want to try is if we can get an administrative account from this attack. So we have the option to log in and use the account user2, which probably does not have enough privileges for us to execute what we want. So our goal is to uh, get access to an admin account and take over the system. Uh, actually, what we're going to do is I think admin will work. So for the demo, I'll remove this one. And I'll put user 2 in there. What we can do then is uh, we can edit a lot of other stuff. Uh, in the pro version, you can add examples like um, cross-site scripting, SQL injection, payloads. Uh, and we want to try what this does. If we want to start the attack, we can go back up to Intruder and click uh, Start Attack. What it says here is that the demo version of Burp is throttled, so this type of attack is not going very fast, um, which is obvious. Um, 
it does 16 requests, and we can open this page to see what it sent. Um, I didn't select the right attack method, but it gave us the result we were after. Uh, what we can see here is that it allows us to do multiple login attempts, and when there is a successful login, it will show us a status code of 302, um, which means that the application does allow brute force attacks. And it doesn't necessarily need to be that we um, find useful logins, but it, during a penetration test, this is an attack method, and it is something that you have to report to your client. All right. Um, basically, I'm walking ahead of the slides. Excuse me for that. I will do a short, um, I'll, I will discuss it short. We pay attention to the request count. Uh, with our request count, we had 16 requests, which means that if you have a larger work list, for example, we can try to load one. Kelly Linux automatically comes, oh, I actually have my accounts here. Um, Kaylee Linux actually comes with a large list of usernames and passwords, um, which is located in user share work list if you're ever going to use Kaylee Linux. And for example, we can use the list in Metasploits and we do Unix passwords, for example. So we see here that with a list of, um, say, about a thousand accounts, our request counts goes up as well. So it can grow very big. And if you do a cluster bomb attack, which sends the parameters differently, um, request count one, request count two, we load the same password list here just for the demo purpose. So we have the same list as usernames and as passwords, which are 1,006 accounts, and it does over a million requests to the web server. That's a lot. So the thing if you have to consider, is this acceptable? Do I really want to try a million requests to the web server, or do I only want to prove that it's possible? And the last option, you only want to prove it, is what you will choose for most during penetration tests. Why? Is because um, you don't have enough time. A penetration tester is getting hired for a few days where a hacker has maybe weeks or months to execute an attack. So letting them know that the possibility is there is usually enough. No. The conclusion is that the web application is vulnerable to a login enumeration attack, which is a nice way to say it. The hacker's way to say it is just brute force. Um, so we are zero, zero, uh, one zero for the attacker. That means that we have success so far. Every application has some kind of vulnerability. So we logged in, and um, what it says here in the slides is that usually we would go through the entire application, and one of the ways to do that as well is in uh, Verb Suite, there is a function called spider. The spider function goes through the entire application and tries to map um, the application, um, which is obviously a lot slower in the free version. We can try to see what it does. If you click a, a request and you select spider from here, it will ask you first, do you want to add this site to your scope? What you can do within Burp Suite is you can def define a scope, which means that Burp Suite will only hit the URLs you specified and nothing else. Because sometimes during a critical penetration test, uh, you do not want to hit certain systems. I just started it, and Spider automatically comes up and says, hey, I found a forum. Do you want me to submit it or not? We want to ignore it for now. Um, but it made four requests, which is the pages it could find. In our target tab, we can see a sitemap. So we can actually browse through the files we have seen so far. And I'm not going to explain a lot more about Burp Suite because I'm not trying to sell it to you but it is a very useful tool during penetration tests. So, 
we move on to the benefits tab and we select 2016 to get this frame uh, in our browser, which is where we want to, oops, excuse me, click the wrong button again, which we want to use as our attack factor. Click. We go to benefits and in our demo, we click 2016 and we press view and we get data. In our top menu, we don't really see very much useful um, information we can edit. Um, I want to ask the audience a question. Can you read what's in the URL or do you prefer if I open a notepad uh, and type uh, it in here? So you can read it better. In the meanwhile, uh, while I wait for your answer, I'm gonna select this frame and show only this frame. Okay, I get the request for Notepad, so that's what I will do, um, which means it is more readable for you guys. Um, this is the URL that's currently in my um, browser, which shows two entries. Just check date, pay periods. Well, the information in there for now is not really relevant for us. We only care about the technique and we only care about the attack. So what happens is we have a URL and we have some parameters which we want to try to manipulate. We have benefit code, we have action, and we have year. Uh, I usually get crazy when I see a number. Numbers trigger me. When I see a number in um, a request, the, you know, the first thing I do is I add an ap ap apostrophe. But we will see why later. Usually, when a regular visitor sees this page, it's like, hmm, yeah, it only shows me some text. I cannot edit anything on this page. That's why we look in our address bar. So what's wrong here is that we cannot see the forms. Um, we look at the values in the URL and we see variables in there. We try to change the year variable and that's the one we, were, we are going to, going to play with. If we edit the year 2016 to 2017, we can see what happens. We get no records because it probably does not have any records yet for 2017. So what we can try to do is we can try to see if it accepts text. Test. Payroll schedule test, no records found. Hmm. That means that we can actually edit information that is being sent to the application, which is obvious, but one of the things here, if you're a programmer, consider this. If my variable is called year, why would I allow the public to insert text here instead of numbers? I would filter it to only numbers. But that's something as a programmer you have to consider. We go back to 2016. Um, what we can try to do is, um, you know, as a matter of hacking, we can try to insert several characters. And uh, to walk a bit ahead, one of the things we can try is to add the ap apostrophe, which I said before. And we can try to see how it can affect a web application. We insert it to our address bar and we press enter and then something happens. Whoops. And this is something you really do not want to show in production. Basically, WTF. All right, so we see if we see an error message which actually tells us way too much. In production environments, as stated in the slides, this is a huge red flag. Um, Basically, at first, this would show up as an information disclosure vulnerability. Why? Is because it shows information. Um, as an attacker, you can see some kind of debug information in this error message, and you want to try, can I manipulate the question that is being sent to the web server? So look at the first line. In this case, this one, it actually includes the full query that is being sent to a web application. Uh, mind you that not in a lot of applications we see this. We usually see a message such as you have an error in your SQL syntax. 
but we don't see this, and we don't see this, and we never see this. So basically, usually the error messages are pretty much default, but this one is very detailed. And uh, what we want to do here is we insert 2016 with an ap apostrophe, and right here is where it gets inserted. Basically, what happens is that because we put this character here, it generates a syntax error in the query that's being sent to the database. Um, there might be a possibility to execute SQL injection here. Um, what we usually say is yes. In my case, if I would see an error message like this, I would think 99% I'm sure I can get in. But theoretically, it's just a hunch. We need to verify that it's there. So how do we do that? How do we verify a SQL injection vulnerability? Well, we can try to add instructions such as and one is one, one equals one. And first I will explain a little bit of how it works. You don't have to be a database programmer to understand this, but one thing you need to know is uh, the basics of a query towards a database. For example, I ask the database to select every column from the user's table, or in this case, uh, from test, where my ID equals something I can insert. Or in this case, let's use the example year. It asks, can I select, uh, give, give me every column from the test table where year equals something I put in there. Um, and now we're gonna tell it, did you know one equals one? So we insert it in our address bar and we were gonna see what happens. No records found. That means that there might be a problem. And why do we, do we still receive an error? It's because if we go back to the previous query, we see that behind our injection, it's like here is this place where we can inject data. And behind it is more data. So it might affect the stuff that we were we are trying to inject. So we wanna filter it out. We wanna get rid of that. And how do we do that is by adding something called common characters. Minus minus, which will actually make everything that comes after our injection obsolete, so it won't get included. Um, in some browsers, a space at the end of the address will get filtered, so you can use a plus sign, which is represented by a space. So this is what our payload will look like. And no, excuse me. 2016 and one equals one minus minus plus. I copy it and I paste it in my address bar. And we still see no results. Hmm, interesting. Comment it out. Let's see what's wrong here. Uh, boop, boop, boop. No records found, something is wrong. All right, we will try to see what happens if we continue. Um, no, the apostrophe is gone. Let me try to see what happens. And one equals one. All right, this way. That's funny. <laughs> oh, right, you guys are right. You guys are very right. Let me try to pretend that I was just uh, making sure you guys were paying attention. <laughs> Yep, you're right. And it also say, says it in the demo. Yep, 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 yep. Okay, we're back on track. So this is what our payload looks like. I see a message that we lost sound. Can anyone confirm this? My sound should be fine. All right, thank you. So this is our uh, payload. I will remove this and put this one a bit more down. Right. Okay, one equals one returns the data, and that means that because we insert something to our query, um, we actually know that whatever we enter is getting inserted in the query towards the database. That means that we can try to speak SQL with it. All right. We know one equals one returns the data, 
and what about 1 equals 2? The confusing thing is usually you would say, hmm, I get an error message because 1 does not equal 2. But in this case, we will get no error message and we will not get um, data. Because the important thing to understand here is that our question towards the database is correct. Um, it, just, it cannot give us any answers back. Basically, the, these steps, so we start with an apostrophe, we do one equals one, we do one equals two. Uh, what we are trying to do is that we verify if the application responds in a way that I expected if it's vulnerable. So if it's vulnerable, as an attacker, I expect it to generate an error message when I use an apostrophe, I expect it to return the data when I use one equals one, and I expect it to be clear when I use one equals two. And from now on, we can start building a small query that we can um, grow to see if we can extract data in the end, to see if we can actually retrieve data from this application. To do this, uh, we must first know where, um, how much tables, I mean, how much columns there are in the tables. Um, think about the database like an Excel sheet. You have tables and you have columns uh, the same way with a database. We're gonna change our payload to what this says, order by one. And what we're trying to do is that we are trying to sort our results by the first column. So indeed, we leave our apostrophe, important thing to notice in this kind of attack, order by one. We, you notice that we leave this at the end to make sure that our uh, query gets executed. So we're trying to sort it by the first column it can see. We get the data back, which is good, which is what we want. We need to find out what the highest number is that this page will return data. For example, if I, return, if I put in 1,000, oops, my syntax error. If I put in 1,000, we get an error because it does not have 1,000 columns. So what can we do with it? We need to know how much columns there exist in the database. Um, and I can explain it better when we have done it. So what I'm gonna do now is play a higher lower game with the application. If the number we're looking for is higher than what we entered, for example, I entered two now. If the number is higher, it will still return the data. And if the number is lower, we will receive an error message. So I start with 10 and we receive an error. So we have less than 10 columns. Actually, because we see an error message, we can try to continue guessing, but because we see an error message, we can actually see how much columns there are. We see one, two, three, four, five, and six. So we see six columns. We can try to verify this by inserting six in our address bar, and we receive the page. If we insert seven, we should get an error message again. And we do. So that's good, we have six columns. Um, I sometimes get the question uh, when we do injections is why don't you use a wildcard? Why don't you use everything? And that one I, ex I can explain with the next step, which is what we're gonna try to do with union select. We're gonna do the following, and keep in mind, SQL injection uh, is not really case sensitive. So you can do it in uppercase letters, uh, characters, but some column names like test or users or uh, accounts, they might be actually case sensitive. So for example, if a web host or a web programmer sets filters on words like union or select or and or Etc. You can try to play with the with the uppercase and lowercase. For example, like this. I actually managed in practice to bypass a filter a client of us set once. Uh, so the client was happy and told us, "Yes, we set a filter so you cannot hack our website anymore." And we played with the characters, and it still worked. 
The problem there was that his uh, filter was case sensitive, which is not a smart idea to do. Union select, and what we're gonna do now is we have six columns because we ended up with the number six. So what we're gonna do is one, two, three, four, five, six. The reason why we do this is something we're gonna see now. We see our two, we see our three, we see our four, five, and six. We see numbers back because that's actually what we're asking for. The union command, um, which we inserted, union um, collapses actually two queries together. So um, we hope that the query we select is the one that's getting the feedback, giving the feedback. And we actually ask it to select a one, two, three, and four, etc. We actually Tell it to show us numbers. If I try to use text, for example, test, test, we will get an error because that will be um, looked up as a column name, which in this case does not exist. So why do I select one word six? is we never see the one anymore in our results. We only see two until six. So if we use a wildcard, that's why, uh, that's what the question was. If we use a wildcard, um, it might be that our data that we actually want to extract, so the goal here is to extract usernames and passwords, is that it gets sent back in the first column. So we will never see it back on the page. That's why we make sure to see where in the query we can insert data. If there are any questions during the session, feel free to ask them in the chat. I'll be happy to answer them. I'll go back to one towards six. <clears throat> Union select, I already explained this. Um, we ask it to return data. The results, if we look at the results we receive, we never see the one back. So in theory, what you could do is we have six columns, so we could Right, to use one, 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 which uh, I can show you will result in the following. One, 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 one. And we always see a one. But now we know, we don't know which, uh, this is gonna be funny, which one of the ones is not being showed on the page. So I go back to the counting number, which is a little bit more obvious. If you have a web application that actually uses 64 columns, for example, um, good luck trying to find the lucky numbers uh, when you're only using one digit. All right. We're going to try to grab some data. And in this case, we're not really going to grab uh, usernames and passwords just yet. We're going to... Um, I asked a question from Carlos. This is just for identify the columns. Uh, yes, we try to find uh, unit selects I can show back. Union allows results from a multiple select statement. So we have our actual query. And we what we're going to do is we're actually going to ask it another query to select more data. And we try to give us the data that we ask it to back instead of what it should return. So it should return uh, information about the check date, pay period, etc. But instead of that, we try to give it back uh, give data that it's not supposed to show us. And that's what SQL injection actually does. We inject different questions so that we get results the web application shouldn't give us. All right. So the first one is at, at version, for example. Um, you see in all the spots that we have in our query, we have one towards six. Uh, all except for the one can return data. So I'm gonna just put it at the end. And that version returns the MySQL database version, which we can try to see here. Version, and it shows us 5.1.41. And if we go back to where we started, where we had the software and the version name of the software we're using, we can actually do the same with this one if we want to search vulnerabilities. Google. 
And Google Hot. This is something you have to consider when using uh, a proxy within Burpsuite. Because what happens now is that because I try to use Google and Google goes to HTTPS, uh, Burp Suite is still active in the background and Burp Suite will intercept the request towards Google and replace the certificate with its own certificate. So that means right now, um, I'll just turn off Burp Suite. So that you can still use Burp Suite within an HTTPS environment, but Burp Suite temporarily replaces the certificate with its own. So I use MySQL vulnerabilities, or in this case, exploit is a different term to use. And we can see what vulnerabilities there are um, for this database. Why will we do this? Why do we search for vulnerabilities if we already have a SQL injection? Well, the SQL injection might not bring us where we want to go. Maybe our goal is to have root access on the machine. Maybe we want to have full control of this server. Um, then we have to try it a different way. And maybe using an exploit on the uh, SQL server itself might be the way to go. So as, an, as a penetration tester or hacker, you have to keep your options open. You have to keep your options as wide as possible. Find as much, many as possible entry points. That's the goal. All right. Next to version, we can use user to see which person is actually logged in into the SQL database. Or in CRM at localhost. All right. Same thing for database. Database. Or in CRM. And one other thing to try is the function load file. Um, if there are between the audience any people that have experience with Linux before, one of the files you can uh, request from a server is etc password, which includes um, information about all the accounts on the machine. It doesn't, if you look at the name, you think, ah, oh, it's going to show us all the passwords, but no. Um, it only shows you the accounts. And we're going to try to get that right now. We use a function load underscore file, and we want to request the file etc password. Mind you, to, to load a file, you must know the actual path for this file. Because you cannot use a search function or whatever. And there we go. There we have an output of the file. It actually shows us the information that is in the file on that server. Uh, and if you know the exact location, for example, of a configuration file, you can try to load that. This is not really easy to read. So one of the things you can do is use a right click, view the page source, all of it down. And there you can see a nice and clean overview of the, in, in, uh, of the content of the file. Right. What does this mean? Um, basically, we have access to the file system. So if we know the location of certain files, we can try to access them. And the usernames that are found in there can be used for other brute force attacks. And this one is quite interesting, because with Burp Suite, we tried a brute force attack on the login form. Um, but because we have a list of user accounts on the server, we can actually try if we want to. We're not going to do it during this demo, but in practice, you want to try to see if you can get accounts like root, or in this case, Postgres, or uh, different accounts. Um, I cannot see the one that I'm looking for. Uh, anyway, you can try to uh, see if you can get a different attack method still get access to the machine. Right. Um, before we start grabbing the usernames and passwords, I want to see if there is a need for a break, maybe a five to 10 minute break. Um, yes, I think, I think we can have five minutes of break. Right. Yes, that's fine. So people can grab a drink. Um, 
If you have any questions, <laughs> Eddie, indeed, coffee break. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and I will try to answer them uh, after the short break. So we will see you in five minutes.
Okay, I am back. I see a question if uh, the talk can be in Portuguese. Unfortunately, I cannot speak Portuguese, so I'm sorry. I think we have another question from Rodrigo Silva. Can you see that? Um, yes. What's the result of those commands if the site has uh, HTTPS only? It's the same result. It does not matter if the site uses HTTPS because it's not related to the transport method. So if you use a secure connection, it will give you the same result. Okay, welcome back everyone. I'm going to share my screen again. Click. And you should be able to see my screen again. I will open the chat, move it to my different monitor. So I can see your questions during the session. All right. Time for usernames and passwords. What we just did is um, we tried an injection. We tried several, several commands. We made sure the website responded in the way we, as an attacker, expected to react. And we tried to take advantage of it. What we're going to do right now is that we're going to try to select usernames and passwords. And before we can do this, we have to guess the table names where the data might be. We have already the union select statement, one, two, three, four, five, six, and we are going to add the from instruction. We want to ask it to select the data from somewhere. All right, I'll go back to my one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, find my notepad. So we add from, and we have to guess some table names. Um, so I'm gonna ask the audience to come up with any names I would, uh, what should I name my table that contains my login names and passwords? Can anyone try to guess one of the table names? User or users from Alexandra. Uh, yes, Fernando, users indeed. So we're going to try it. Users. From users. We get an error message, which sometimes means, in this case, a table, Orange RM, which is a database name, users does not exist. And <clears throat> it has, this is um, difficult. Clients might be an option, but the results that I'm trying to say is, is the same customers maybe indeed. The problem here is that the website uses database uh, table prefixes, which means that there is a text before the table name. So we try to look at the query that's originally executed, and what we see here is a from instruction hshr pay period. So this might be a prefix. Um, right now we are trying to guess table names, which is in practice usually the most easy and fast way to find uh, table names. Um, from MySQL version five and higher, there is an extra database in your database called information schema, which contains all the metadata for your database. So this database actually um, contains all the table names, column names, everything you need to know. So that's useful for the system administrator, but also useful for hackers. Well, we look back at the from instruction and we see HSHR pay periods. So that's a prefix. The error message indeed tells us all we need. So we're gonna try to add it uh, to our in injection. Alfredo has a question, can't you use select table name from information schema to tables? Uh, yes, uh, Alfredo, that's exactly what I mean. It is possible, yes. But we're gonna try 
the easy way here, which is HS HR users. We're going to try that. And we now do not get an error message. Why not is because um, I think the table exists. Otherwise, it would tell us it doesn't exist. Uh, but we don't see usernames and passwords. Why not? Is because we didn't ask it to show us usernames and passwords. We only ask it to select one towards six. So it literally gives us this number. All right. Bingo. The table exists. So what we've done so far is um, I already did a quick summarizing from uh, after the break. We tried some command. First, we tried a brute force attack to see if it was possible. And yes, it is possible. So that's one vulnerability in the application. Uh, what we tried next was to see if we can identify a SQL vulnerability, an injection vulnerability. And yes, it exists. Right now, we have worked out a basic query, which uh, I usually call um, wrong one, which I usually call an injection query. You can see. Well, while we're working on it, it gets longer, it gets bigger. Um, so that's what we did. And right now we add, we guessed a column, a table name, and now we want to see if we can grab data from somewhere else. So we try more guessing. And actually, the slide already tells us what to do, but um, usually things like user, password, username, uh, account, login, or email, those are column names you will usually want to try because those are usually the default column names you see. Um, we can make a long story short and tell you that what we will end up with is user underscore name and user underscore passwords. Um, by looking at the error message, you can actually learn a lot about the application. Maybe in my case, if I would if I would program a website personally, I would uh, select start date as start date, and end date as end date. In this application, it goes start date, end date. So where I would use username, the application uses username. So it's just a, a preference from the programmer. It's not necessary to use this way. You could use a login name, for example, it's just a name that's been given to the field. So by looking at the error message, you can learn a lot from the application, about the application as well. All right. So we put one value at four, one value at six. Why? Is because we see a four here and a six here. So if we put it at five, we would get it here. All right. So user name, user password. There we go. Now it spits out usernames and passwords. And if there were more usernames and passwords, it would actually show them. <laughs> and this is actually what happens in practice. Websites get hacked, uh, data gets published um, because of a SQL injection. That's usually the way websites get hacked and information gets leaked. Uh, what we see right now is a username and a password. Well, this is not an actual password because we have had the user2 account with a password of user2. So this is encrypted somehow. I want to ask the audience if, um, if, if uh, someone can guess what this is. So in this field, this is the place where the password is. Um, yes, Alfredo says user2, that's the plain text version indeed. Carlos says it's an MD5 hash, which is correct. Uh, Miriam says base64. Um, it is an MD5 hash. How can you determine if it's MD5? It's because it contains hexadecimal values, which is from A towards F and 0 towards 9. And the length of MD5 is always 32 characters. So MD5 hash is 32 characters. That's the easiest way to recognize them. Um, 
We could. Uh, <laughs> Eddie says, and now John the Ripper. Um, yes, Eddie, I can I can try to show that. But in practice, the most easy way to crack an MD5 password is to go to Google. As you noticed, Google is not only a search engine to find out what the um, what a recipe is for a certain food. You can also use it for hacking. So we look up the hash in Google, we just paste it in and see if we can find something back. And it says encoded value is user two. So in this case, because it's a quite easy password, we do not need to uh, use our uh, processor or graphic card or any resources to crack the password. Um, Eddie uh, came up with, uh, with John the Ripper, um, and some of you might not know what it is. John the Ripper is the name of a password cracking program um, that's very popular. That's one of the most used programs to crack passwords. Um, I can try to show you how it works within Kali Linux. We open up a terminal screen, and as a hacker, I recommend you to learn how to work with a terminal. We edit uh, a file called CrackMe, and as you can see, I already tested uh, a login there before, so I'm going to insert a new one for user2. Uh, no, in this case, we wanted to try to get the admin account, and of course, we can Google this one, which <laughs> I can probably tell you is admin, but we will just try it. Admin, admin, and we put in the hash. What I'm now going to do is use the program called John the Ripper, which you can call uh, by typing John, um, which outputs a lot of information. But if you go to John the Ripper and just say, I want the content of the file called crack me, I want it cracked. Um, there is a problem we're going to see right now is that John the Ripper, in this case, cannot really determine what kind of hash it is. Take a look. We get a lot of error messages. It says, hey, I detected the hash type uh, LM. Well, this is not an LM hash. So it says, if you think this is a Lotus 5 hash, uh, you should use this command. Right, so we know it's a MD5, and in John the Ripper, you need to determine the format of this hash. It's a raw MD5. And I press Enter. And within a second, it's already cracked. Because the password is so easy. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about password cracking here, but the stronger your password is, the longer it takes for an attacker to hack it, or to crack it in this case. So admin, admin. That means we now have administrative login details to the application, and that was one of our goals uh, we, we right now achieved. All right. Um, in some applications, this is a problem that you might see when you use this in practice, is um, in our application, we see all the accounts listed in the database. We see them under each other in the results. But in some pages, you only see one result. So for example, if we would see only user two, we could make use of the function within SQL called limit, limit. A limit might work a bit confusing. Limit, uh, usually commands you would go through and say, I want the result from one to 10. But limit doesn't work that way. Limit works as follow. I want to start at the first result, or maybe in some cases with a zero, the first result. And I only want one result. So limit is not um, from an, uh, two, but limit works from, I want to start at this number of, um, results and I only want this amount of results. So I say I want to start at the beginning and I only want one result. And we're gonna see what it does. You can see our injection in the address bar getting longer and longer while we do this. And right now we don't see any results. Um, oh, that's obvious because um, it also includes the results from the previous uh, injection. Um, so we might have to do 1.1, so we start at a different one, 2, ah, there we go, limit, 2, comma, 1. 
gives us the first, first result. So limit three, comma one, sorry, I'll put it here. Um, two comma one shows us the admin account, so three comma one should show us uh, the user one. And it does. Four shows us the user two, and five should show us nothing because there are no uh, five results. There is no fifth result. Um, so we do not get an error message because it understands what we're trying to ask, but we also do not get any results because it doesn't have anything to show us back. What if there was only one position where we could return data? Right now we have five. We have the numbers two until six where we can return data. We could use a different function within MySQL to accomplish that. So I use my admin account in this case, and I put back the four, and this will end up as, oh, now let's go back to one towards six. Nah, not, because then our limit function won't work anymore. All right, we'll use this payload. There we go. We only see one field and we only see data at the end. So what we want to do now is, I'll chop this in pieces just for your readability. There we go. I want to use a function called concat, and concat stands for concatenate. And what it does is, it's explained here. It's not explained here. This function allows you to concatenate two or more expressions together. So what you can do, if you only have one field where you can return data, you can use this function to return multiple fields in one field. So we want to use concat user name, comma, I'll get back to this one, comma, password, uh, you, uh, user, sorry, user password, excuse me. And it will look like this. Admin, semicolon, and the hash. And in this format is the way that the most password cracking programs accept their data. So if we look at the crack I just did, you can see that I put admin, semicolon, and the hash because then John the Ripper or any other cracking program knows where is my username, it's before it, and where is my password hash, it's after some call. Right. So, um, why do I use 0x3a? Um, 0x represents for the fact that you are going to use hexadecimal data. I'll go use my this one. In practice, you could try to use quote, semicolon quote, um, but some applications go wild because this apostrophe, it might return an error. It might result in a syntax error or any other problem you're running into. Plus, as a hacker, this looks way cooler because you know your hexadecimal values. Just kidding. Same function, just different way to put it. Right, um, all right, I already walked ahead of the slides, I'm sorry. Um, well, hashing functions, in this case, what happens is that there are meta mathematical way to form a hash and you cannot just return it. Um, one person named Base64, Base64 is an encoding, which means that you can actually reverse it. Uh, MD5 hashes are encryption methods, which are not really reversible. The only way is to already crack them. All right, let's see here. What's next? We already did this. We could use a password cracker. Uh, we could try to use Google. Um, administrative access. Can we try to get the admin account? We already did that. Again, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not really a fan of slides, so that's something to get used to. I'm more of a demo guy, so that's why I walk ahead of the slides. So we can want to try to see if we can log in to see if we can maybe access details from other people.
Well, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to log out. I'm going to I'm going to use the admin account. Admin, admin. Just to verify it works. Yes, it works. And now we have a tab called admin. That's interesting. You can see some test data here. We see users, HR admin users. There we go. So we can actually go through the application as an admin. So we can see all the accounts. Um, for example, if this was really a hack, what you could do is just add a new admin account and hope they never find out. There is um, a way to automate these steps. You can use a tool called SQL Map, and probably most of you guys are going like, ah, why didn't they say that before? Um, I, there's a reason. Let's say you use a tool to do these steps automatically. So you put in the URL in, in, in the tool and you say, yeah, you go ahead and correct it for me. You go ahead and try to find if there is a SQL vulnerability, if I can extract passwords, and maybe if I can crack them automatically. Um, but what if at some point this application goes, I crash and I stop in the middle of the process? What are you going to say to your clients? Um, well, I thought there was a SQL injection vulnerability, but I didn't manage, so I think it's secure. What happens next is in the next two weeks, the website gets hacked and they come back to you and say, hi, you tested this, but what's wrong? So. It's not very good for your credibility as a pen tester. You need to make sure that you know what you're doing. Using tools is not wrong. Using tools is okay, as long as you know what they are doing and why are you using them. Um, before I am going to show SQL map, um, are there any questions from the audience so far? Is everything clear? Um, are there some parts that maybe went too fast? Uh, some things that I didn't elaborate good enough? Um, let me know. And then there was silence. Feel free to ask uh, the questions if there are any. All right, thanks for the feedback. All right, SQL map. We can... Um, Go a little bit in depth here because we still have some time. I'm at this moment. I'm at the end of my slides, so um, I'm just going to go ahead and show you some about SQL Map and maybe show some bonus uh, material, whatever you guys are interested to. Um, I have a question from Alexandra. Uh, considering the real apps today with many framework tested, is it common found some pretty basic SQL and SQL injection like that? Yes, um, in fact, I'm gonna go away. Um, I'm gonna show you guys something, but I'm not gonna cross the line, if you know what I mean. Um, this is a very gray area. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna, let's go on the internet and actually see if there is any vulnerability. Just to see, we're not gonna hack them, and I really must ask you um, anything we see, don't abuse it, it's illegal. Um, I'm going to use Google and I'm going to ask the audience to give me a random keyword. Just anything that comes up in, in your mind. Foundry. Right. That was the first word I got from Carlos. Thank you. I'm going to add something here called in URL. So I want to make sure that uh, whatever I'm going to add next is included in the URL of the page. And for example, I can do I want PHP files, and I want that there is an uh, ID variable. What we can do now is um, I'm just going to open a lot of these links in my uh, browser, and we're going to see if we can quickly find any vulnerable websites. Because how to explain it better than just to show you, right? The question was, does this occur at this moment in uh, existing applications? Can you find these types of vulnerabilities in the wild? Right, so I have a few tabs open, and what I'm gonna do now is I'm just only going to insert an apostrophe in the address bar after the number. 
Here we can see we get redirected to the main page, nothing wrong. We're just gonna do the same thing everywhere. I see two parameters here, so I'm gonna do it in both. Nothing wrong here. Not found, nothing wrong there. Nothing wrong there, this one takes too long. Nope. Was the same site already opened? Nope. Right, there we have one. You have an error in your SQL syntax, check the manual that corresponds, blah, blah, blah. Um, theoretically speaking, this only shows us we were able to create an error message. We were able to do something that the application doesn't like. Um, I can almost guarantee you that if we wanted, we could get into the database of this website. And I'm not gonna do that because I do not have permission to do so, but I can almost guarantee you it's possible. So, um, <laughs> exactly, Eddie. Everything is for dictating, did that, yep. Wow, difficult word, didactic proposes. Yes, educational proposes, yep. I know, but we're, I'm not gonna go there. So that's basically the answer to your question. Just find a random keyword, add something in Google, put add apostrophes towards numbers you can find, and within a few seconds or minutes, you will have a vulnerable website. So yes, it occurs in public. And not only just the random websites, but um, um, I'm also talking about um, bigger companies, financial companies, uh, and so forth. Eddie asks, what's the difference between hacking and pen testing? A customer's permission? Um, there are a few borders you can actually go. Um, you have different types of hackers. You have white hat hackers, which are hackers that only hack with permission. Um, they ask if they can, they can hack or the regular pen tester is considered to be a white hat as well. You have your black hat hackers and those are the bad guys usually. Uh, those are the guys that enter, enter your network and you don't even know they were there. And then you have something in between called gray hat hackers and these hackers, they actually hack websites. So they do right what we do now, but they actually hack the website, they actually grab the database to see if they can get in and then they notify the people and be like, hey, I found a vulnerability in your website, here's how to fix it. So they help people, they, they cross the line because what they do is, yes, it is illegal, but they don't do it uh, with um, uh, evil proposals. They do it to help people, they do it to make the internet a bit safer. All right, back to SQL map. SQL map, um, is there a, um, is a tool that you can use to automate SQL injections? Uh, Jose asked a question, is there some way to know when someone is getting into your website? Um, there are several ways to uh, eventually do that. Um, there is something called an intrusion detection system, which you can implement. You could use a web application firewall um, these are actually terms you can might see in practice, IDS, uh, WAF, um, and there you have your um, Apache, which is the name of web server, or well, let's not be specific, web server logs. For example, if I wanted to, um, let's see if it's possible, um, if I can log into the machine, that's wrong. Give me a second, I don't think it's possible. Ah, it is possible. Um, all right, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna show you the log file. There we go. All right, this is a log file of the web server. And we can actually see what I did here. Um, let me refresh the one second, click. If I refresh this page, you can see here that in the web server, it shows me 
what someone requested. He did a get, get request towards this page, and you can see the, SQ, the SQL injection in here. So yes, it is possible to see it, but um, not a lot of people watch their logs a lot. Usually, people only look at logs when there's something wrong. When something already happened, they'd be like, hmm, let's find out what happened. And then they go over the logs and they're too late. Uh, the log file in this case contains the IP address from the visitor, uh, the time and date which it occurred, the request he or she did, and some information about the browser. Um, for the people that might be interested in this, uh, there's something to say about this. It's called the user agent and it's something that gets sent to the website with everything you request. Every image you see, every page you view, this line that I just selected gets included. It tells us a few things. Uh, one is X11, which is the Linux display driver. So by only these three characters, I can tell that person is using a Linux system in a graphical environment. Um, this is confirmed, and it's a 64-bit machine. Revision 38.0 shows us that the user uses Firefox 38.0. Uh, um, and then I can now try to see, hey, what people in my organization are using this kind of system? Um, but what you want to get notified is something called alerting functions. You want some application that can monitor your website and alert you um, by saying, hey, someone is doing something nasty. Uh, there are also modules you can install in your web server. Uh, one, for example, is um, from Apache Web Service Mod Security, which is very popular. You can try that to block SQL injections and already uh, do stuff. There's a, a software package called CSF, which is called Config Server Firewall. Uh, they're open source, so they're free. Um, and you can configure them on your server uh, to make it a little bit more secure. Uh, one question before we go to a SQL map from Jose again. The SQL injection depend if the code protocol is, for example. Um, I do not really understand that question, but you ask for get or post. Um, if it depends on the protocol, I can answer it in two ways. Um, it does not matter if there is a get or post, because right now the injection we are doing is coming from the get method. But yes, it is also possible to do SQL injection in post method, in forms, like registration forms. Um, I even found in practice during a penetration test once, I found a SQL injection in cookie fields. So that's also possible. Right, SQL map. Let's say we are, let's go back to where we were. Um, Oops, wrong one. Let's go back to the beginning where we were before. Right, so now I see um, I see something here. And what I want to do now is say, hmm, I want to see if SQL map can handle this for me. So, Let's go to SQL map. And I say, hey, I just found this website. I just um, gonna see if what happens if I put an apostrophe in there and hmm, yes, it gets blocked. I mean, I get an error message, so something is wrong. And say we don't have the time or we don't want to actually verify this manually, you can go to the terminal uh, screen and go to SQL map and say, hey, I have a URL for you. I have an address you can visit, which is right here. Good luck. So you feed it to SQL map, and SQL map comes with a warning that says, hey, um, you cannot use this software illegally. Uh, you should only use the software, and I recommend doing this as well. You should only use this kind of software if you have permission to attack the target. Um, we might have a small issue here. Why? We got to redirect. Um, why is because this will never work, and I can, I can tell you why. Because the application, if we if we use this URL and we open a new screen and we go here, it just brings us back to the login screen. Why? Because the application requires cookies. So what we're going to do is I'm going to reactivate my Burp Suite plugin to easily find my cookies. You can use a plugin for that if you want. 
Um, no, let's see a different way. Um, F12 brings up the console in Firefox. I go to network. I go reload. And let's see if we can get a response code from here. Request header. There we go. The, the idea is to get your session cookie. Right. So I copy that. And we can see in the help from SQL map how that works. I bring back the URL. Um, whoops. Bad. SQL map, please help me. And here it should show a function to include cookie data. Uh, it should be somewhere on top. Here. Sorry about that. I'm trying to find out. Here we go. Data. Right. All right. So you have to use data. Minus minus data equals, and I paste the cookies I just selected. Uh, this shouldn't be correct. Ah, sorry. That's uh, sorry. I'm uh, confusing you guys right now. Um, what I just did, data, is when you want to use post strings. Um, if you want cookies, you need indeed minus minus cookie. Um, so to answer the question from Jose again, uh, SQL map automatically can do post injections for you. Uh, cookies will allow uh, fields from a cookie. And SQL map can also be used um, to inject into cookie fields. Right, there we go. What it does is the following thing. We have a few parameters. Uh, we could see we have benefit code, we have action, and we have year. Um, the field where we used the SQL injection was the year field, and that's actually where we wanted to go. But because we have multiple fields, SQL map will automatically say, hey, I'm gonna try every one of them. This might take a lot of time, so if we don't want this, we can do the following thing. We can go back to our address, and after where we wanted to inject, I put a wildcard. I say, I want you to inject here. And we see what happens. It says, hey, I found a custom injection marking character. You want to process it? Yes. And then shows, I did a quick test, and I think the database uh, of this page might be injectable. The possible DBMS, it stands for Database Management System, is MySQL. Uh, we verified that by the error message we got earlier. So if we generate the error message, it shows MySQL. You have different kinds of databases, MySQL, Microsoft SQL, PostgreSQL, uh, anything. So we wanted to just use that one. Uh, since recent, SQL Map automatically also checks for cross-site scripting vulnerabilities for anyone that's interested in that. It asks you if you want to skip the payloads for other databases. Yes, because why would I talk Microsoft to a Linux machine? Not that MySQL is Linux specific, but right. What it's going to do now is it's going to it's going to try a lot of different methods just to do SQL injections and it will test us several of them. You can see here it does a so-called time-based blind. That took a while. A time-based blind SQL injection is, uh, it gets a yes or a no based on time. It says, hey, the, vulnerable, the parameter is vulnerable. Do you want to keep testing the others? Um, in this case, we have a few. Let's say it found an injection in benefit code then it asks you, do you want to continue, yes or no? Do you want to test action in a year? Um, and here is where uh, hackers and pen testers have um, differences. A hacker doesn't mind wherever he gets access. He just needs one spot, and that's his entrance. As a pen tester, you actually need to test every single parameter for your customers. So. Long story short, you have to be able to do in two days what they have to do in two weeks. That's what it comes to. You want to keep testing the others? In this case, no, because we selected a custom injection point. 
And then it does, um, it shows us what it found. And it shows examples. And a Boolean based blind, a Boolean is a yes or a no, zero or a one, true or false. And we've seen this before. Did we? Yes, we did. If we look at the end of this injection, we see and one equals one. It doesn't matter what kind of number it is, it's, we recognize it. We've seen this before. Right. A time based blind does it on, on base of time. And here it uses hexadecimal values. So, um, and this is not that hard, but there are several uh, SQL injection methods. The one we've seen is very, um, is, is like the basic method of SQL injection. And SQL injection can get very complex. It can get very hard where you have to maybe do uh, mathematical formula, formulas, um, hexadecimal values, um, maybe even bypassing firewalls, intrusion detection systems. Right. So if you use this in practice, the next step is to say, hey, what databases do you have for me? And it will output every database it can access. So what we are using right now is a vulnerable uh, virtual machine called the OWASP Broken Web Apps. It's a free virtual machine you can download that contains a lot of vulnerable applications with the intention of being vulnerable. Um, I can show it to you quickly. If we go to the main page of this uh, box, we see also a warning do not run this machine on a public internet because you will get hacked. Uh, and there are a lot of training applications, realistic applications, uh, old vulnerable applications, which are actual existing applications. Um, for testing tools, uh, demonstration applications. Anyway, uh, I'm not trying to advertise here for OWASP, but they do have very useful material you can uh, use for testing and learning. Right. So we have a list of database names, and uh, we want to do in our case, we're just going to stick to the Orange HRM database. I'm going to define it in SQL map and say, hey, I want you to check this database, and I want you to give me all the tables that you can find in there. As you can see from the, um, no, you cannot, see, yeah. You can see here in the results that there is a database called information schema. That's where it's going to get its information from. There we can see all the tables that are in this database. And as we found manually, we can see HS, HR, users. We can say it, you want to use this table. And we ask you what columns are there. So you can see we don't need to guess it anymore. The application does it for us. But there is a point where this application might say, um, I'm not gonna do this anymore for you. So you're on your own. And that's why you have to know how the technique works. We say username, user password, and we see a lot of more information that we don't really need as a hacker. Well, maybe in some cases you want it, but if we only wanna log into the application, we do not need his phone number. We do not need his full name. Uh, what we might want to know is if the user is an admin or not. So what we do is we define user name and I want user pass. So you can define multiple ones here. And I'm gonna sell it to dump the information to me. And dump in this case doesn't mean clear it or remove it from the database, but dump means download the information. And something went wrong because I made a typer, a typing error. It's password, not pass. Right, so it says, hey, I found some password hashes. Do you want to store them in a file so we can maybe later try to crack them? Nah, I'm not gonna do that. Um, do you want me to crack them for you? What? Yeah, of course. So SQL map can automatically crack the hashes that it finds. Um, it asks you what dictionary to use. Because it's MD5, we cannot decode it or decrypt it. Uh, what we need to do is we 
have a list of usernames and passwords, in this case passwords only, and we want to see if that matches up. So it goes through the entire list of passwords and it converts them to MD5 and matches it with our stolen hash to see if, um, if it matches, then it cracked the password. And SQL map comes with a default word list that is pretty decent. It's not the best one, but it's okay to use in practice. Um, do you want to use common password suffixes means, do I want to add a one after a password? Do I want uh, an exclamation mark? Do I want an uh, at or a dollar sign after the passwords? Yes, I do, because then I have more chance of cracking a password. I press yes, and SQL map will automatically start to crack these passwords, and it will find them really quick, admin, admin, user one, user two. Uh, once it's finished, it will make a summary of these hashes, and if it cracked the password, it, would it will also show it in brackets. So the hash is this one, and the password is this one. Um, to use them quickly, you can also see the CSV file, so you can use them in Microsoft Excel to process the data and use them how you want. And that basically covers the demonstration. So um, I want to give the word to my colleague uh, Hans, and um, after that we have we can we have room uh, for a, a few more questions. Um, uh, we will share. Uh, the, uh, I don't know if we share the presentation. Um, yeah. I, I think some, someone else will answer that question. We could, um, but for now I want to give over the word to um, Hans. And then there will be a quick room for questions that you have for the demo. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Um, everyone, thank you for attending uh, this workshop. Um, of course, it was just a workshop, not really interactive. The group was too large for that. A couple of hundred people, that's too large for interactivity. But if you are interested in the, taking the full course, contact Milena, and we, we will make you a uh, reduced price offer uh, for the full course, and the full course is interactive. So you do things on your own laptop. Patrick or another teacher can uh, uh, help you with any problems. You can ask questions. There's more room for interactivity there. And uh, we do the full course. So we do things like uh, password cracking, but also uh, other things that are not in this workshop. So if you're interested after this uh, little teaser, as I can call it, then please contact Milena for the full course, and we will make you a reduced price offer uh, if you want to. And thank you for attending, and if you have any questions, please uh, ask Patrick, uh, he knows a lot, so if you want to ask things, uh, uh, please do so. Thank you for being here, and maybe till next time. All right, thank you, Hans. Um... So Patrick, thank you so much uh, for your presentation. I think it was a really good one. Uh, everyone you will receive information package by Exin about the Exin ethical hacking and Exin security program. Uh, we include in this package a voucher with 15% off for all of foundation exams. And then you will receive information about the courses that they have to. So I don't know if we have more questions, Patrick, to answer. Or? I see a question from uh, Yefer. Is this method for website only? Um, no. You can use SQL injection for any solution that uses a database and uh, allows you to do um, they're breathing very heavily in the microphone. Hello? Yep, there we go. Sorry. Um, um, so, for example, if an application uses a databases uh, outside of a website, yes, it might be possible to do a SQL injection there. Um, well, thanks, you guys, for your time. Um, I hope I did well. <laughs> I hope it was understandable. Um, and if there are any questions, feel free to contact us. Um, and I hope to see you in one of the foundation courses uh, at the Security Academy. Okay, so please don't forget to fill out our survey. This is really important for us.
for the future events. And then we invite you to visit our website and you can find the new portfolio of vaccine and you can find the ethical hacking certificate and also the security program. Uh, so I think we are done. Thank you everybody and see you next time in another webinar. Thank you, Patrick, again. You're welcome and thank you attendees for uh, taking your time to participate. Bye-bye.